Welcome. Today we're going to explore blockchain together. My name is Laura Ciceri and I'm the founder of Supply Chain Insights and today I'm going to share the insights that we have gained through the Network of Networks group, which is a share group working on blockchain and improving business-to-business -business connectivity. This webinar will be shared through YouTube, it will be placed on LinkedIn, and we'll also share the slides. So please share freely with anyone in your network. We also have a LinkedIn group for the Network of Networks group, which we include sharing. Our goal is to drive advancements in B2B connectivity because we're stuck. Most of the company's efforts today are very focused on enterprise flows and processes and the movement to B2B is something that we want to really accelerate. So let's start, what is blockchain? Sometimes people will say, you know, Laura, what is blockchain and how do I go about thinking about blockchain and what is an immutable ledger? So blockchain is a incorruptible, immutable digital ledger of transactions that can be programmed to record anything of value. Separate the discussions of cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, from blockchain. Blockchain, as this immutable digital ledger, allows us to record transactional information and also unstructured information in a digital ledger, a system of records, so to speak, between trading partners. It can be within the organization, can be with one-to-one -one trading partner, one-to-many trading partners, but we're going to share today that we have not found that the blockchain technologies have been equal to the challenge of many-to-many -many in the recording and transmission of digital ledger information. Now, this word immutable, you know, let's think about what that means. You know, I had uh, one of my clients say, well, Laura, when I think about immutable, I think about the crossword puzzle that I do on Sunday. And I get the New York Times, love the New York Times. And one of my favorite things to do on Sunday is curl up in the chair and do the crossword puzzle. Now, my mother could always do the crossword puzzle in ink because she was just really good at it. And I have to do the crossword puzzle in pencil. And the client said, you know, to me, immutable is like doing a crossword puzzle in ink. And instead of being able to erase, I strike through. And I can still see the original record of what I put in the crossword puzzle, but I'm striking through. I do not have the ability to erase data. So if you think about the portal strategies that we've been employing for the last decade, portable portals lack a system of record. They are not immutable. So if you post something today that's information for a business-to-business -business relationship, it can change tomorrow, and there is no tracking of that data. So this concept of immutable and incorruptible are both very, very important. However, while blockchain is secure, the software on top of blockchain may not be. So for example, Hyperledger has a contract management piece of software called Fabric, and Fabric is not as safe and secure as the blockchain itself. So when you're thinking about blockchain, think about not only the transmission with blockchain, but also the software. And there are many variants of blockchain. They're public and private domains, and many people don't understand the differences. So a private blockchain would be like the work that Walmart is doing in China with pork producers. It's private for them and they're tracking lineage. A public domain will actually have node maintenance and will require the transformational information for a node. So when you go through the discussions of blockchain, you've got to think about the definition one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-many public versus private, the selection of software, and also the blockchain technologies themselves. So with that as a base discussion, let's talk about why it's so disruptive and also why it's so promising. In our research, which is open and we share with everyone, we recently did some work on digital transformation. And I define digital transformation as the transformational processes that change the atoms and electrons of the supply chain. 
the atoms change through things like 3D printing, fermentation. The electrons change through things like blockchain, cognitive computing, software robots, and drones. The clients that took the survey see the most disruptive technologies as blockchain, cognitive computing, software robots, and drones. Decreasing are the Internet of Things and data visualization. So when we think about data visualization, we're thinking about technologies like ClickView and Tableau and Anaplan. And when we think about Internet of Things, we're thinking about the streaming data architectures that are currently being built on Apache Spark. And the definition of sensors is allowing the recording of this data at the edge in the sensor and is really transforming streaming data architectures to drive transformation in digital manufacturing and replenishment and transportation and logistics. However, those technologies are more known and the implications on processes are clearer. When we get into the yellow box where we're talking about the redefinition of blockchain, perhaps the redefinition of EDI or the ability to track lineage or the ability to be transformational in processes. For example, we don't know how to share demand data across multi-tier processes. We really don't know how we can monitor safe and secure supply chains. Those are all redefinitions of processes and disruptive. And same thing with cognitive computing as we go from single if to single then statements for things like ATP and allocation and inventory and order matching to multiple ifs, to multiple thens that can allow systems that learn. Blockchain on top of cognitive computing can transform B2B networks. And that's what we're studying in our share group with the network of networks. So today when we look at digital transformation, we can't just think about digitizing the supply chain. Digitizing the supply chain takes data, makes it digital, and basically puts today's processes on steroids. Instead, what we've got to do is step back and think, you know, 90% of companies are stuck. They're not able to drive improvement. And how do we transform the processes through the combination of open source analytics, which is one-fifth the cost of relational analytics, things like Hadoop and Kafka and Apache Spark, and combine them with blockchain, streaming data, 3D printing, robotics, wearables, mobility, and cognitive computing together to be transformational and process definition. Now, there's some use cases that we're working on in the network of networks. The network of networks is a share group that combines technologists and also business users. And we're testing things like a community registry could we write once and onboard? So I'll talk to you about the work that we've been doing with ALEI, which is the state registration of perhaps we can write once and use many times using the ISO standards. And we're working with the uh, supply chain operating networks of uh, Alemica, e to open and also GT Nexus to look at could we have community interoperability across these supply chain operating networks, which have canonicals, which do not integrate very well together? Could we replace EDI? Well, that's really off in the future, but you know, as we work on the early days of blockchain, which we're walking right now, you might even say we're crawling, right? There is glimmer that perhaps we could transform what's today EDI messages because EDI messages are sort of like getting a piece of mail from the post office. You've got to open it. It's not bidirectional. And, you know, what you get is usually not current with what you need. So, you know, we're looking at how can we have blockchain to be able to drive interoperability. The most promising case studies and the most advanced in the market today are around lineage track and trace and safe and secure supply chains. This allows us to track and trace across parties. Pearls, diamonds, things that have clear standards are the first things that are really being adapted for lineage. However, I work with a number of agricultural companies that are looking at lineage for perhaps it's the traits associated with seeds or it is the usage of additives on crop or the track and trace of food. 
So track and trace safe and secure supply chains are the most advanced business use cases we're going to talk about today. Improving social responsibility goals, which is getting at things like fair labor, fair trade, you know, how are the trading partners basically giving an input to drive social responsibility goals? Those cases are not as mature, but they're very promising. Supply chain finance is the ability to transform multi-tier finance, perhaps through cryptocurrency, perhaps through payment on delivery, and that's some of the ways that we're working in the network of networks, and we'll show you a case study today. And then just good old-fashioned document sharing. You know, we have lots of contracts that are negotiated by well-intending lawyers, but they sit in drawers. They're not combined with transactions. One of the good things about blockchain is the ability to connect unstructured documents like contracts and quality specifications with transactional data to be able to have an immutable ledger that is not corrupt. So, you know, as you think about the blockchain discussion, we have to think about many types of networks. We have one-to-one -one networks and 90% of the case studies that I follow for blockchain are for one-to-one. -one. So it is a company to itself or to a trading partner. You know, the case studies of where companies have multiple ERPs, for example, Schneider Electric has over 100 ERP systems, and many of you may have heard Brian Tessier talk about the work that he's doing within Schneider Electric to be able to connect within Schneider. And then we have the one-to-many case studies where we still have a channel master who is trying to connect with multiple parties. Again, that's fairly straightforward. However, we find that the blockchain architectures are not conducive to many-to-many. -many. So what we're doing in the network of networks is we are connecting supply chain operating networks through blockchain, allowing the supply chain operating networks of Alemica, GT Nexus, and Eda Open to actually be the many-to-many -many hubs and perhaps the nodes of the future blockchain infrastructure to connect many to many. Now, in the network of networks, we've found four truths from the testing, and the network of networks is a share group that has been in existence for 18 months. First, blockchain is new and evolving, and it's greatly overhyped. There's more unknown than there's known. We cannot find any use cases that demonstrate the use of blockchain for many to many networks. And we're working on the testing of blockchain to link the supply chain operating networks that are in existence today. Interoperability between existing supply chain operating networks is not as good as we'd like it to be. And so one of the things we're working on is improving connectivity between the supply chain operating networks, but this is an area of opportunity. While we believe that this is a great area for growth in that the business to business and network models, you know, are ripe for the picking. We do not have a definitive ROI today. We've done some work around return on investment for onboarding. We know that the average company takes five months to onboard. We know the workforce to do that. But we do not know the ROI yet for blockchain, but we have five active case studies that I'll share today, and we're going to share the ROI of these case studies at the upcoming Supply Chain Insights Global Summit. We also realize that through our work, data definition is important. Location data is extremely important, and it's not okay just to have Latin long because you can have floors within buildings or you can have, you know, two different areas within the same latitude and longitude for receiving. So one of the things that the group has done is worked on a greater understanding of the GS1 and the ISO standards, and I'll talk a little bit about the LEI standard to give you some perspective on what we're doing. But before we get into blockchain, let's just talk about the world of visibility. When we grew up over the last two decades, I think we believed that ERP would be our system of record and that we would connect transactional applications from my ERP to your ERP to their ERP. An ERP is a system of record for financial systems within the enterprise works well. It is not the system of record for the extended enterprise. What we found through the last two decades of work, we still manually touch orders and purchase orders. Today, the number of orders 
that can move hands-free with no interventions, about 20%. And the same thing for purchase orders. So while we've been working on this for a long time, we still have a lot of touching of orders and many clients are portal to death. Portal strategies are not very effective because if you're a small company, you can have hundreds of portals that have no system of record. And so we're sort of at a standstill in the evolution of data between companies. We also know that the top business pains are volatility, alignment, and visibility, and these go hand in hand. We've built functional alignment within the organization and primarily focused on automating the enterprise. The area of B2B is hard to even get a group of people together. You'll often have people that are in the sales team or in IT or in procurement that work on B2B that may not even know each other. And so the focus on B2B is difficult because there is so much focus on just the enterprise. We know also that visibility that we have actually achieved has been more within manufacturing within the company. If you look at visibility importance versus performance, where blue is importance and green is performance, you can see inter-enterprise order management to customers, which goes along with demand, demand streams, point of sale data, it's a huge gap and not something that we really understand at a multi-tier process canonical how to handle. We also have great gaps in first tier suppliers and logistics networks. And these are many to many types of challenges. And one of the things that we wanted to do in the network of networks was look at, could we automate this through blockchain? We also know that every year when we publish the supply chain to admire, and we look at companies that are working well versus companies that have room for improvement, there are five major differences. One, the understanding of the supply chain. Two, supply chain visibility. Three, the ability to manage talent, cross-functional alignment, and ability to use data. So we've not made a lot of progress in visibility. It's important, and blockchain is promising. So 18 months ago, we started the work on building the network of networks. It started with Procter & Gamble and Dow saying they could not connect GT Nexus, Ariba, e to open and Alemica. And they wanted to know how could they bring together the current supply chain operating networks to build a network of networks. And also wanted to know, could we test and learn together through the testing of blockchain and other technologies? And I'm going to share the five use cases we're currently working on and the current state of these. Our ultimate goals were to determine the ROI for the future state of B2B visibility, which we are not very far along on right now because we're early in the testing, advance the learnings and insights of business and technology leaders. So we asked business and technology leaders to come together as equals. We asked the technology leaders to test free of charge. We asked the business leaders to basically volunteer their time. We're also starting to do the work on multi-tier process development of how do we have many-to-many -many flows. We're very early in this work and there's a lot of work to do and we're testing and learning and trying to improve the organizational fabric within an organization to improve B2B processes. And our goal is to close the gap, to define inter-enterprise visibility and interoperability and to bring manufacturers, retailers, and distributors together to be able to drive and build the issues. It's an open sharing, a meeting of technology and business users. Testing involves no exchange of money. And if people are interested in joining after I share the use cases, please drop me a line and let Regina and I know. The manufacturers that we've been working on are companies like Nestle, Dow, Procter & Gamble, Grace, Savonic, Berry Global, Intel, Corning, Lanxus, Schneider Electric, Intel. And the technology providers are technology providers like IBM, Bristol Cone, Newology, Lemica, Cloudera, Open, Savvy, GS1, SAP, Halo, Intera, and GT Nexus. Now, not everybody can come to every meeting, but what we're trying to do is to really change the dynamic of visibility. One of the things we did was we interviewed the manufacturers within the group to understand where are they on visibility, and we found you know, three different patterns. Twelve of the companies were very focused on brand owner, which is a focus on the channels, deduction, shipment focus. 
one company as an intermediator, 400 portals, portal to diff, looking at compliance, and nine were looking at commodity supplier information and commodity networks. So we're at very different places within even the network of networks on the building of B2B. We talked about the four truths. Now let's get into the case studies. The case studies that we're working on are four case studies. One is contract manufacturing and price management, the ability to have price masking and to manage the sourcing of materials to a contract manufacturer to come to a network to ship to a retailer. We've asked the F4SF group, Foundation for Strategic Sourcing, to help us with this, and we've presented the case study to them, and it looks like it's going to be adopted to be able to do the testing within the F4SS group. The second case study is a material provenance. It's to be able to look at lineage. Uh, it's a very global case study to Wrigley, which is looking at thread integrity, cap manufacturing, and looking at track and trace of materials across multi-tier. The third is an onboarding pilot, which looks at can we use ISO standards to be able to apply ALEI for interoperability between today's supply chain operating networks and allow supply chain operating networks to service the nodes to be able to then drive blockchain for things like multi-tier finance. The furthest case study in development is the European multi-tier finance and we had a meeting in May with the German banks, and we have our next meeting in June. And it is a case study that is looking at the interaction between BASF and Avonic and Imperial. And this case study, we have Imperial, which is a third-party logistics provider. We have BASF, and we have Avonic with a buyer and seller relationship. And we have a public blockchain network where we're actually using Centrifuge to be able to look at the interactions between a bank. So the concept is that we have the buying relationship that goes through Alimica as a supply chain operating network. We have the shipment by Imperial. We have the proof of delivery, which triggers the payment. And this is what we're working on this summer. And what we're trying to determine here is the definition of a node and also the intricacies of the public blockchain and the uh, potential to drive multi-tier processes to be able to drive payment and trigger payment on delivery. This particular case study is going to be reviewed in June at the Avonic offices with the European Network of Networks. We have about 30 people that will be at that. And if people are interested in working on it or understanding more about this particular case study, we would encourage you to either dial in and we'll share the WebEx information or to be there in person. The second case study is the trading partner data model, which is based upon ALEI. And ALEI is based upon the registration of the company for legal identifier. And basically what we also have are proxy legal identifiers that can be used like the DUNS number or the GS1 prefix but what we're trying to do in the network of networks to communicate across blockchain and other supply chain operating networks is ALEI. And what we've tried to do is test the feasibility of the use of ALEI and also working to publish and subscribe across the Limica, GT Nexus, and EDA Open, the ALEI data. Now we did a test where we had 24,000 suppliers and 81 companies we were able to confirm ALEI for 17,000 suppliers and 33 companies, and 7,000 of the suppliers were asked to provide more information. And so what we were able to do was to really, for this particular company that was onboarding for blockchain to a supplier, to be able to look at the number of suppliers and to be able to read once, or write once and use multiple times. So if people are interested in ALEI and the work we're doing with the ISO group on the standards, please let us know. The additional case study is lineage. In this case study, we're tracking from Berry Global to, from their supplier, Poly One, and we're looking at the issuance of PO to a supplier, the feedback from the supplier, the supplier's tracking, 
and we're looking at the auditing and the warehouse acceptance. This is a typical lineage case study, and this is being built on Hyperledger and is being built uh, with Fabric and Hyperledger in conjunction with IBM. The test is a PO from Wrigley to Barry, PO from Barry to second tier color supplier, Poly1, ASN from a second tier supplier to Barry, manufacturing details from Barry for bill of material for part for schedule, ASN from Barry to Wrigley and compliance documents and quality documents. Note here that what we've got is the combination of transactional data and unstructured data compliance documents, quality documents, and the immutable ledger between parties. We are hoping to be able to drive the completion of this in July for sharing at the Supply Chain Insights Global Summit. This is a private blockchain test case, whereas the one that I showed you on finance is a public blockchain case study. What we're trying to do is to understand the nuances of both to be able to understand the definition of a node. We don't have a clear definition of a node within blockchain many to many, and what we want to do is understand what that looks like. The fourth case study is a case study on procurement and contract manufacturing. This case study is the less the least development least developed in the four that we're testing and deals with the manufacturing supplier contract manufacturing relationship. So here the CM is the contract manufacturer, the supplier is a raw material supplier. It's basically materials that are sourced by the customer or the manufacturer. The manufacturer has a relationship with the contract manufacturer. And we also have a commodity index. So sometimes supply is based upon an index and sometimes the manufacturer that buys the materials does not want the contract manufacturer to see the price and price masking and sometimes the contract manufacturer also sources the same materials and it can be at a different price so what we're trying to do is to work on the concepts of multi-tier sourcing price masking and the connection to the commodity index with Foundation for Strategic Sourcing. And this case study is actually a food contract manufacturing case study to be able to track multi-tier pricing across different supply alternatives. So we have multiple case studies that we're testing. Again, we've learned that blockchain has more hype than we would like. And it's hard to get the vendors to get past the hype, to roll up their sleeves, to get to the substance. We also find that there is more work on one-to-one -one versus one-to-many and many-to-many. -many. There's more work on private blockchains than public blockchains. There are more questions than there are answers. However, blockchain is extremely promising for a couple reasons. One, the immutable nature of it. Two, the ability to have structured and unstructured data to be able to pass. And three, just the great opportunity that we have to be able to automate B2B and drive very different type of interactions. I don't have any questions at this point in time, but I do want to encourage people, if you would like to work with us, to do testing that is not hype, it's roll up your sleeves, really get to work. We have our next meeting in Europe at Hanel, Germany at the Avonik headquarters. We have the Berry Global hosting of our next North American meeting, which will be in Charlotte. And if people would like to get involved, just send me an email. I noticed that Aaron would like to get involved. Uh, now, Ryan has asked a question of what is ALEI, and ALEI is an ISO standard, which is an identifier for a company. So when companies are registered, we register with entities. So for example, Supply Chain Insights is registered in the state of Delaware. I, when I registered the state of Delaware, I had to basically register, and there's a registration process, and there is a set of codes that is an mutable identifier with the company when I register. So the concept of ALEI is we could use the corporate registrations for onboarding. 
it's actually very, very promising, and it is also something that allows the uh, use of standards and perhaps gets us past some of the issues. Robert wants to know, why is it about many-to-many -many that makes it so challenging? Well, blockchain technology is not set up at this point in time for immutable transactions across many-to-many. -many. The work that has been done on the Hyperledger project has really been one-to-one -one or one-to-many. And as we talk about the many-to-many -many interactions, most people that do not work in supply chain or in supply chain operating networks understand the nuances of the complexity of the transactions for both security and also the transmission. And, you know, it's a surprise to us when we were actually starting to do the work to find out that there's so little understood by the blockchain technology com community about many to many. So I think it's about maturity and understanding, but it has to do with role-based permissions in the many to many network. Uh, Murrow says that she's out of uh, Charlotte and she'd like to uh, understand. And um, basically, you know, we will provide to everybody on this call, you know, some information about these two meetings. They are open meetings. Uh, they're a couple of boundaries. One, you know, there's no such thing as dumb questions. Two, we do not support any one technology. The technology companies that are working with us are many, and the ones that are doing the testing are IBM with Hyperledger, uh, Centrifuge with a public blockchain, and um, also we're doing some work on a private blockchain using boardwalk tech. So we've got different technologies we're using. We're also very thankful to have the support of Alemica, Eda Open, GT Nexus, and the testing. We'd like to have more work from SAP. We'd like to have more work from the uh, EDI vendors, but at this point in time, we've not been able to secure it. So if people would like to come to this meeting and help us to test it and do ROI, we would love it. Now, the recording of this uh, webinar will actually be shared on LinkedIn, and it will uh, basically be available for everyone. Question is, is blockchain a technology or a concept? It's a technology. It is a class of technologies that is really for an immutable ledger that allows the passage of data. Originally, it was designed for cryptocurrency, for the secure passage of cryptocurrency. And uh, it's very, very exciting uh, because it allows the secure transmission of an immutable ledger, which combines structured and unstructured data. And there's lots of technologies that have grown up around blockchain. You know, there's, um, you know, the work on Hyperledger, there's the work that we've got on Boardwalk Tech, there's the work with Centrifuge, there's the work with SkewChain. There's the work that, you know, we've got with Pier Nova, you know, Staybridge. We've got lots of companies that are working on blockchain that are basically working on the same concept. They're working on software on top of blockchain. But it is a class of technologies like ERP or advanced planning that has evolved. It's a question about leveraging blockchain for invoice and transaction data as an input for commercial risk. Um, in, in credit scoring, and you know, I think that the um, information there is fine. What we see is that the use for credit scoring and risk mitigation will typically happen in a one-to-one -one network or one-to-many network. We are not to the point yet where we can actually move the data in a many-to-many -many network, which is, you know, where we really have mo most of the uh, in interest. I also have someone who said that, you know, it's blockchain's hard to follow for assets and change formats. Um, track and trace, we don't find, um, you know, that to be the case. So, um, you know, but we're testing. So, uh, you know, you'll have to let us know. There's a question about uh, point of view for Internet of Things and blockchain. Our testing right now for Internet of Things and blockchain connectivity says that that's pretty difficult. Uh, it's 
streaming data uh, on blockchain has been pretty difficult. We are actually working with a couple of companies that are working on scalability questions that we have on blockchain. So, you know, we have, you know, a whole lot of work to do there. These are very early days with blockchain. So anybody that is doing work in this area needs to go in with their eyes open, knowing that we're early in testing. It's like 1980s for ERP. Uh, in the finance pilot, there's a question about, you know, the transactions that we're doing. We're basically looking at an ETA and we're also looking at a POD and, uh, you know, the movement of money against that. And, uh, you know, perhaps a couple of iterations where maybe there's a return or there's a shortage in the uh, exchange of information about the delivery. So those are some of the things that we're testing. The June work will allow us to get it up and running and to be able to uh, use it. I have a question about artificial intelligence and the use of blockchain. You know, I envision the day where blockchain will be basically read and written based upon cognitive computing to manage the master data between companies. But we're a long ways away from that. Uh, and the movement of data today is still very much standards-based, rules-based ontology and master data to read and write off a of blockchain, I think is probably five to 10 years away. But we basically have to walk before we run. So I thank you for joining us today to understand uh, where we are on blockchain testing. I will send the links through Regina for people that want to join the Network of Networks work. And again, the Network of Networks work is looking at these four case studies, the differences between private and public blockchains, the use of blockchain across different use cases. And as we work on this, my advice is, you know, if you're sitting out there and you've never really started to work with blockchain, avoid the hype. You know, the Power, pretty PowerPoint slides, you know, be skeptical. We're still very early. And if you want to test blockchain, start small within the company with a goal in mind. So Brian Tessier within Schneider has worked on a blockchain case study just within Schneider on returns. Or you could work on a blockchain pilot, you know, perhaps within a company on deductions, right? So start small, uh, you know, and, you know, be clear on what is the goal. If it's deductions, you know, focus on matching. Explore the alternatives and understand the possibilities, but keep your eyes open. Again, blockchain is very, very promising, but, you know, we've got to not just automate today's processes. It's a time for us to take a different path. And we will be having a blockchain breakout session at the upcoming Imagine Conference, which will be in September. We'll have a breakout session for blockchain case studies, cognitive computing, Internet of Things case studies on the first day on Tuesday. It'll be in the afternoon. And these case studies are really handpicked to be the most advanced case studies that we've seen on these three technologies. However, at this point in time, we do not see the coalescence of these technologies very often. And then on the Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday parts of the program, we will be dealing on the digital revolution, which is really looking at not just how we digitize the supply chain, but how we drive digital processes, which basically make us ask the question about what should be the atoms of the supply chain? You know, Should we be selling products? Should we be selling services? Should we be printing? Should we be fermenting? What what should the atoms be and the electrons of the supply chain in terms of multi-tier processes, the transmission, the system of record, and the movement between parties? We hope to see you there, and thanks for joining us on our webinar today. This is Laura. Until next time.